Philip Levine graduated from the factories of Detroit to become one of America's great poets. His poetry, which he describes as an attempt to give a voice to the voiceless, has been collected in such award-winning volumes as Not This Pig, They Feed, They Lion, Ashes, What Work Is, and most recently, the Pulitzer Prize winning The Simple Truth. On October 17, 1996, Philip Levine visited the Writers' Institute in Albany. We learn to accept our failures. I think that's the thing I see with my students, that the ones who cannot accept their failures, forget it. They're going nowhere. They are judging themselves by, the, by standards they don't deserve. Nobody deserves those standards. Walt Whitman wrote badly. He's our greatest poet. Emily Dickinson wrote badly. She's damn near our greatest poet. I mean, if our greatest poets can write badly, then why can't we? Of course we can write badly. And if we won't extend ourselves that freedom and that generosity will stall ourselves. We'll just stop. We have to accept that. And, and I've done that for myself. I've said, Phil, you can write really badly. Now you know that. And when you do it, just throw it away. It, it's relatively harmless. Few trees suffer, but you know they recycle this shit. What work is? We stand in the rain in a long line, waiting at Ford Highland Park for work. You know what work is. If you're old enough to read this, you know what work is, although you may not do it. Forget you. This is about waiting, shifting from one foot to another feeling the light rain falling like mist into your hair, blurring your vision until you think you see your own brother ahead of you, maybe 10 places. You rub your glasses with your fingers. And of course, it's someone else's brother, narrower across the shoulders than yours, but with the same sad slouch, the grin that does not hide the stubbornness the sad refusal to give in to rain, to the hours wasted waiting, to the knowledge that somewhere ahead a man is waiting who will say, no, we're not hiring today for any reason he wants. You love your brother. Now suddenly you can hardly stand the love flooding you for your brother who's not beside you or behind or ahead because he's home, trying to sleep off a miserable night shift at Cadillac so he can get up before noon to study his German. Works eight hours a night so he can sing Wagner, the opera you hate most, the worst music ever invented. <laughs> How long has it been since you told him you loved him? Held his wide shoulders, opened your eyes wide, and said those words, and maybe kissed his cheek. You've never done something so simple, so obvious. Not because you're too young or too dumb. Not because you're jealous or even mean or incapable of crying in the presence of another man. No, just because you don't know what work is. I've learned the things I can do to stop myself, but not the things I can do to start myself. I know, for example, that if I'm a, a liar, I'm not going to want to hear my words. I know that if I drink too much, the next morning I'm worthless. You know, that there are a number of things, you know, that if I do, I'm going to stop myself. But what I can do to start myself, I don't know. And I don't believe in any kind of, uh, you know, that meditation will do it or the drugs will do it or any of this stuff. None of this is, I've tried them and not extensively, <laughs> the drugs, but I have tried them. They didn't do a damn thing. You know, I remember. The one time I took acid, the only thing I discovered was that the room got so aggressive. You know, you know, I could think, why didn't, why, you know, just be a room. The door, you know, the wall, all, everything being so meaningful. Just calm down and I'll calm down and I don't need this crap, you know. Uh, you know, 
So I, I don't think there is a, I don't think there really is an answer. I think each of us finds what we, you know, the things we do that can stall us, and then we learn to be patient. This is called Monsieur Degas Teaches Art and Science at Durfee Intermediate School, Detroit, 1942. <laughs> it's about Edgar Degas. It's not really, it's partly about Edgar Degas and his teaching career uh, in Detroit, uh, of which, you know, almost nothing is ever said in biographies. <clears throat> Very unusual and gifted teacher. <clears throat> Monsieur Degas teaches art and science at Durfee Intermediate School, Detroit, 1942. He made a line on the blackboard. One bold stroke from right to left, diagonally downward, and stood back to ask, looking as always at no one in particular, what have I done? From the back of the room, Freddie shouted, you've broken a piece of chalk. Monsieur Degas did not smile. What have I done, he repeated. The most intellectual students looked down to study their desks, except for Gertrude Bimler who raised her hand before she spoke. Monsieur Degas, you have created the hypotenuse of an isosceles triangle. Degas mused. Everyone knew that Gertrude could not be incorrect. It is possible, Louis Warshawski added precisely, that you have begun to represent the roof of a barn. I remember that it was exactly 20 minutes past 11. And I thought at worst this would go on another 40 minutes. <laughs> it was early April. The snow had all but melted on the playgrounds. The elms and maples bordering the cracked walk shivered in the new winds. And I believed that before I knew it, I'd be swaggering to the candy store for a Milky Way. Monsieur Degas pursed his lips and the room stilled until the long hand of the clock moved to 21, as though in complicity with Gertrude, who added confidently, you've begun to separate the dark from the dark. I looked back for help, but now the trees bucked and quaked, and I knew this could go on forever. One of the things I like about contemporary American poetry is, is that it's so diverse. And, uh, you know, a lot of people get upset. They say, oh, look at those people. I can't stand what they're writing. Why are they called poets? I welcome that. I grew up at a time when there was a kind of official style that was determined by a few literary magazines like the Kenyon Review and the Swanee Review and the Hudson Review. And it was a rather conservative literary style. And uh, I think the Beats did a, I think uh, the Beats did a great service to American poetry. It's sort of explode that notion so that uh, so that we now see uh, you know if a guy wants or a woman wants to write a charged up crazy angry uh, Whitmanian sort of scream against American capitalism that can be a poem too uh, you, you don't have to have Ani as John Crow Ransom used to pronounce it irony said Ani uh, and uh, you don't have to be you know, neoclassic in your structure. Uh, you don't have to be a kind of Mandarin poet. There's room for everybody. It's an open house. And I like that. Uh, but as far as a poet being a truth teller, I think, I think, I think that within the poem, uh, there's, there's invention, but I think the, invent the intention of the invention is to get to a greater truth of, in terms of, of the, of the, of the poet's emotion response to the experience. And somebody said, what does it take to write a poem, to be a poet? And I said, well, it takes talent. You've got to have some verbal talent. Just as you've got to have foot speed to be a sprinter, so you have to have verbal talent to be a poet. You need persistence, drive, commitment. I don't know. It's all the same thing. That, that will keep you there year after year. And you need luck. And the person said, what do you mean by luck? And I said, well, let's say you marry, the, you marry a beautiful man or a beautiful woman, and that man or woman could give a, you know, nothing about poetry. 
Why are we sitting home writing? You know, you're writing those goddamn poems, and I want to go dancing. Well, you know, I mean, or or why do we have to drive a you know a Chevette when we could be driving a, you know a Lexus? Because you're writing your rotten poems. I mean, if they don't, if the person that you decide to live with, that man or that woman, doesn't take that enterprise as seriously as you do, you're in trouble. And that's luck. Because getting a good husband or a good wife is just luck. You are sexually nuts. You don't know what the hell you're doing. Especially, if, maybe if you get married at 40, you got a brain, I don't know. But otherwise, it's not your brain that's directing you. And, and so if it works out, you are a lucky dog. Don't go telling people how smart you are. All right. So I'm done, and I'm, I've described all this. And Joy says, you forgot something, Phil. You forgot something you need to be a poet. And I said, what's that? She said, you need a story. You need a story. She's right. And I suddenly thought, you're right. There has to be something there that you have to tell. Now, Rilke tells us in his letters, we all have the story. It's the magic of our childhood, blah, blah. All right, he's right, but most of us lose contact with the magic of our childhood. And remember it, as, as Larkin says, you know, or, or no, it's Orwell who talks about his memories of his father as it, when he was a child. A large man smelled of cigarettes and said no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, it's not going to give you too many poems. The poem of chalk. On the way to Lower Broadway this morning, I faced a tall man speaking to a piece of chalk held in his right hand. The left was open and it kept the beat for his speech had a rhythm, was a chant or dance, perhaps even a poem in French. For he was from Senegal and spoke French so slowly and precisely that I could understand as though hurled back 50 years to my high school classroom. A slender man, elegant in his manner, neatly dressed in the remnants of two blue suits, his tie fixed squarely, his white shirt spotless, though unironed. He knew the whole history of chalk, not only of this particular piece, but also the chalk with which I wrote my name the day they welcomed me back to school after the death of my father. He knew feldspar, he knew calcium oyster shells, he knew what creatures had given their spines to become the dust time pressed into these perfect cones. He knew the sadness of classrooms in December when the light fails early and the words on the blackboard abandon their grammar and sense and then even their shapes so that each letter points in every direction at once and means nothing at all. At first, I thought his short beard was frosted with chalk. As we stood face to face, no more than a foot apart, I saw the hairs were white. For though youthful in his gestures, he was like me, an aging man, though far nobler in appearance, with his high carved cheekbones, his broad shoulders and clear dark eyes. He had the bearing of a king of Lower Broadway, Someone out of the mind of Shakespeare or Garcia Lorca. Someone for whom loss had sweetened into charity. We stood for that one long minute, the two of us, sharing the final poem of chalk while the great city raged around us. And then the poem ended, as all poems do, and his left hand dropped to his side abruptly, and he handed me the piece of chalk. I bowed knowing how large a gift this was, and wrote my thanks on the air where it might be heard forever below the seashell's stiffening cry. Because I didn't like myself as a guy working in factories. I thought, is this the best you can do? What a schmuck you are. You went all the way through college. 
There's an expression in Yiddish, Dasmer game in college. For this she went to college. I remember telling my grandfather I was going to become a poet, and that's exactly what he said. For that she went to college. And then, and then he started telling me about this. When he grew up in Russia, in the Ukraine, actually, there was this guy who, who wrote poems, this old Jewish cat, who went from house to house and would recite his poems, and they'd have to feed him. And he said, you don't have to go to college to do that. Any dumb dog can do that. I said, it's a little different here, Grandpa. Said, oh, do what you want. <laughs> By this time, he knew he wasn't going to have any influence on me. I, I read T.S. Eliot, and that was a, an electrifying experience. That was the first modernist poet I read. And I saw that you could write a poem without transitions, you, you know, that you could do incredibly daring things. I'm not sure I understood proof rock that well. I'm not on, or Gerontian, or, you know, The Wasteland. I'm not sure. I didn't need to understand them. I saw what was happening. I reacted to the language. I also was reacting very powerfully to the fact that there were, these were poems about cities. Mm -hmm. These were poems about people who lived in cities. The city was usually London. Uh, but it didn't matter. It was familiar territory. And I had never read poem, poetry about cities. You know, all we ever read back in high school was, again, rural, bucolic poetry. And this was exciting to see the 20th century city in the poem. I suddenly said, geez, you know, this all this. I don't have to write about the rain and the sky and this. I can write about that factory over there, that Buick. Uh, that guy coming home from work, which, you know, that guy throwing something at his wife. I mean, all the domestic. The guy upstairs. Like yeah, yeah. All this stuff was neat for poetry. And I began to write a different kind of poetry with Eliot as my master. And then I stumbled across Eliot's vicious anti Semitism. The Jew squats in the windowsill, spawned in st some estaminet of Brussels. The cafe. Everything goes on in the cafe behind the rail yard. The two women who work the bar are from Albania. So the men try not to look down their blouses for fear of their brother, Anton, who sits alone smoking and slowly drinking the pink wine of Michigan. Have you ever had the pink wine of Michigan? They say it's made from watermelons and rancid strawberries. And it smells like old socks that too much drives you nuts. When Anton has too much, he likes to sing songs of home to the workers at the bar who understand nothing. The women flirt shamelessly. They run their tongues over their teeth. They roll their eyes heavenward. They bend over every chance they get so their skirts ride up the backs of their thighs. Anton goes out into the night to piss on the truck tires and curse God. Even Jerome, our weightlifter, won't cross Anton, though he bullies the rest of us. Shemansky and the nigger beat me out, he says. A Polak and a nigger. We'll hear the story of a, a thousand years, how he went two days by Greyhound to the trials just to lose, how he was cheated, how he was the real winner. He spits all this into my face, the shame of his loss flooding his scalp with blood, the small pale eyes frozen in their sockets. He never even saw New Orleans. Took the first bus home and hid in his room for days. From the rail yard, you can hear the boxcars coupling and uncoupling, the switch engines starting up or breaking. Even after it rains, you can look up and not see the moon or stars. I stood one night for 20 minutes, staring up until my eyes tired, and it began to rain. Louisa, the younger girl, has blue-black hair. She leaves unbound and deep brown eyes. If you stare into those eyes, she will stare back. If you reach across the bar to place a hand on the damp hand she rests on the bar, she won't withdraw hers. The night Bernard said he loved her, she smiled, unclenched her teeth and said, now you must marry me. Anton said he was phoning a priest that second so he could give her away. Bernard sobered up with coffee, a bowl of soup, and two hard-boiled eggs. No one ever saw Bernard again. They say Anton cut him. I don't think so. Some nights the workers just drink in silence. The air thickens with smoke, 
and no one cares if the two girls show their thighs or their breasts. Some nights, the young men along the bar are too tired even to die. So as you hear it, it did surprise me with this despair and anger. Why don't you write in a longer line? Why don't you open it up? Why don't you put garbage cans and waitresses and paratroopers and, you know, and, you know, uh, skunks and chipmunks and sparrows and buicks? Why don't you, in refrigerators and, you know, crackheads, why don't you get America into your poetry? Why does it always have to be dawn? And three guys are out waiting for ducks to land, and you know, and it's you and you're 12 years old, and it's you and your uncles, and you know, why is it always? Or, or you're in a room with the light coming through, and there's a beautiful dark-haired woman, and pretty soon something interesting is going to happen between the two of you. But the poem will end before it happens. Why is it always such a pure world? Why can't it be the messy one we live in? And he, and he, he, he says to me, that's the world you write about, Phil. I said, yeah, but it's also the one you live in. He said, yeah, but I don't like living in it. <laughs> you want, I want to live in that other one. I said, okay, I mean, you know. And I still believe that, that, uh, that essentially what governments have done to us, uh, uh, especially a government so totally bought as our own, is to separate us from each other, to blind us to the fact that we are a single entity. Uh, and make us think of each other as very different and competing for what there is here. And, and they've, you know, they've, they've fostered that on us. We bought it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you see the way, you know, like the Nixon strategy for gaining the South. Well, I'll use anything uh, to make white people think uh, black people threaten them and their jobs, et cetera. I mean, we see it. I saw it as a child. I, I still see it. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I've lost my faith that, I've partly lost my faith in the American people that if, that if they're told the truth about the nature of their life, their lives, that, that it will have any impact. I think a great many people hearing the truth say, oh, oh yeah, but I still want my BMW. You know? <laughs> or I'll be an anarchist just as soon as I get that Leica and that BMW and that terrific uh, stereo set and blah, blah, blah. The simple truth. I bought a dollar and a half's worth of small red potatoes, took them home, boiled them in their jackets, and ate them for dinner with a little butter and salt. Then I walked through the dried fields on the edge of town. In middle June, the light hung on in the dark furrows at my feet, and in the mountain oaks overhead, the birds were gathering for the night, the jays and mockers squawking back and forth the finches still darting into the dusty light. The woman who sold me the potatoes was from Poland. She was someone out of my childhood in a pink spangled sweater and sunglasses, praising the perfection of all her fruits and vegetables at the roadside stand and urging me to taste even the pale raw sweet corn trucked all the way, she swore, from New Jersey. Eat, eat, she said. Even if you don't, I'll say you did. Some things you know all your life. They are so simple and true, they must be said without elegance, meter, and rhyme. They must be laid on the table beside the salt shaker, the glass of water, the absence of light gathering in the shadows of picture frames. They must be naked and alone. They must stand for themselves. My friend Henry and I arrived at this together in 1965, before I went away, before he began to kill himself and the two of us to betray our love. Can you taste what I'm saying? It is onions or potatoes. A pinch of simple salt, the wealth of melting butter, it is obvious. It stays in the back of your throat like a truth you never uttered, because the time was always wrong. It stays there for the rest of your life, unspoken. 
made of that dirt we call earth, the metal we call salt, in a form we have no words for, and you live on it. Thank you. Nobody ever knocked on the door and said, write poetry, Philip, please. You know, I mean, it was my idea. And so now I have to take responsibility for it. When it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And, uh, and I think my greatest strength as a writer is my patience. I have been patient. I, patient. I have weathered these periods. Uh, I've never had what's called a writer's block. Dashiell Hammett says in, in one of Lillian Hellman's books, Dashiell Hammett, who she lived with, says to her at one point, uh, she's talking about having a writer's block, and he says to her, there's no such thing, Lillian. If you would just put your ass on the chair, you would write. 